Watch this. Safe to say it's been a year like no other Idaho governor has ever seen. I mean, most governors haven't seen in a year what Governor Brad Little has seen over the last couple of months. And today, he took a moment to share his thoughts on what's happened and what's ahead. Looking back even further, it was a disaster instigated by poor construction. 45 years later, the Teton Dam remains lay untouched, relics of a deadly lesson learned. It's finally Friday, and we're finally able to get out and about to ask you about some good news. Oh, it feels so good. What a whirlwind it's been in the world of Idaho politics these past 12 months. A statewide state of emergency because of a never-ending pandemic surrounding a seemingly never-ending legislative session to now a crowded field in the upcoming race to run the state in the future. The GOP primary election for governor is set to take place in about a year from now, and it's going to be an interesting one. Idaho's, Idaho's lieutenant governor is hoping to unseat the current one from the same party. And although it is not official yet, the current one isn't expected to go down without a fight. Not a stretch to say Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan and Governor Brad Little have had a unique relationship of late. The former issuing an executive order while the latter was out of town, who then had to come back to rescind it. Joe Paris sat down with Governor Little today to talk about the back and forth with the Lieutenant Governor and their relationship going forward, and for some insight on the tumultuous legislative session, plus his perspective on lessons learned through the pandemic. It's been compared to when the parents go out of town, the kids throw a party. You go to Nashville for a conference, you know, lots of action happens while you're away. Is this something that was a concern while you were boarding the flight here in Idaho that, okay, we know that when I leave, Lieutenant Governor becomes governor and they could act? Not really, not, not, not really. It, uh, I'm aware of that because obviously that was a job I used to have for quite some time, uh, but I, I, I wasn't losing sleep over it. Certainly a unique relationship between you and the lieutenant governor, and it's not anything new. It's been well documented that there are times where it doesn't appear the offices are on the same page, but you've still got plenty of time before any elections to govern the state with the second highest elected official. Are there concerns about coordination between the offices or do you feel you can push through professionally and there won't be any issues? Well, people of Idaho expect us to get things done and to work together and that's going to be our, my goal. I know when you put out your release a week ago, um, people noted that it was very strongly worded and something that some didn't expect. What to you, I guess, was the focus in having such a strongly worded and direct statement in terms of your executive order to undo an executive order? Well, I mean, it would have been, if, if we would have had a heads up, would have been able to have a dialogue about it prior to the issue, it would have been different. But the fact that it was, a, you know, something that we weren't aware of until the Secretary of State called me, I just wanted everyone to know that that's I don't think what people in Idaho expect. Did the events of last week change the course of, I guess, your plan of action or any arrangements you had for the next year? Or is it to you just maybe just a bump in the road? Well, it was it was a bump in the road, but we'll we will get by. Very notable legislative session, of course. Everyone in the media we like to talk about how it was the longest. But when you think back to your state of the state address and the ideas that you had outlined, did everything that you wanted to get accomplished, get accomplished, or do you feel there was a lot left on the table? We gave them the ideas and they implemented them. It, was, it, took, it took plenty of time, but uh, uh, I was pleased. If you check off the items, tax relief, getting these kids caught back up, more investments in schools, the career ladder to pay teachers, and then of course transportation, which I've talked about for 11 years when I chaired the Transportation Task Force for Governor Otter, we finally got a big, bold, uh, sustainable transportation plan implemented. On the property tax bill that you signed into law, I've spoken with Idahoans, they said it's mixed signals because he did sign it into law, but in your transmittal letter, you wrote that I mean, essentially you had some concerns about it, some grave concerns about it. I talked with the Majority Leader, Representative Mike Moyle, he said, well, this is a first stab at it, we'll of course take this up again. Do you think the lawmakers could have accomplished more on property tax? Yeah, perhaps. It, a lot of my objection was the fact that it was kind of the last day and a lot of people didn't have a chance to have input. Uh, the counties were kind of okay with it. The cities 
had problems with it, but a lot of it is we're not sure how it's going to be interpreted. And we've been working on that. I've been working on it with the tax commission, with the cities, with the sponsors of the bill. And that's, that's where, we're, matter of fact, I've already shifted some personnel at the tax commission over to help the cities ensure that they can implement this and it's not going to be too onerous. It's almost like a compliment of the problem that since you've been governor, Idaho is such a place that people want to live in. People are flooding in from around the country. Um, a lot of people talk about the conservative values in the state, others just talking about it being a family friendly area. And you can welcome all these people into the state, but how do you balance welcoming newcomers and making sure that longtime Idahoans aren't priced out of their neighborhoods and they're forced to go live somewhere else? Well, when I was in Nashville last week, I turned on the news in the morning. I thought I was watching Channel 7. Uh, they were talking about the problem with housing affordability and growth in Nashville. But frankly, there's hardly, I don't think there's any state that have the rate of growth that we have here in Idaho. And we're, as I say, we're victims of our own success. But a lot of those issues are best addressed at the city and county level. And we want to help all we can to help the cities and counties uh, cope and plan for growth. That critical race theory bill that you signed, there seemed to be two camps that supported it. Those that said, this is happening in Idaho and we have to stop it from happening. And then the other camp was, it's not happening in Idaho, but we want to make sure that it never happens in Idaho. Do you see yourself in either of those two camps? Or I, I'm, I'm definitely in the second camp. It's not happening in Idaho. In my signing statement of that bill, which I wasn't very excited about, I said what I really didn't like was the indication that it was a problem in Idaho. Uh, even the sponsors of that legislation said it wasn't a problem in Idaho, and it was kind of a blocking maneuver uh, to keep it out of here. I, I frankly don't want to talk about it that much because it isn't existing, and it's derogatory to the professionalism that's taking place in the class here, and I know there's just great work being done, particularly this year with all the sacrifices uh, teachers had to make. Clearly the news cycle has been very cluttered over the last year with an election and the pandemic. A lot of things have gone under the radar. I know I talked to lawmakers that say, you know, this happened, no one knows about it. This happened, no one knows about it. For you, what's something that we're not talking about, Idahoans aren't talking about, that you're very proud of and you wish people saw something had happened? Well, the, uh, the transportation was a big one. That's one I've been working on for a long, long time. Uh, and of course, the first impact of it is there's going to be those orange cones out there and they'll probably name a few of them Brad and people might even run over them while they're uh, out there. But, you know, it's the right thing to do to plan for prudent investment in the future uh, for both safety and for uh, congestion because one of the things that when it gets all said and done is it saves people time, their most precious commodity. And another follow-up question I had for the governor is about lessons learned since the beginning of last year. He told me that, you know, for the majority of the thoughts he's had, he feels like they acted appropriately and he stands by the decisions he made. He did say, though, that, of course, there are some things that he would have changed. Um, one thing that he really focused in on, Brian, was the Department of Labor and kind of the mess we saw with unemployment and so many Idahoans suddenly filing for unemployment. And then there was extra benefits coming from the federal government. And he said if he were to do it over again, if we were to retrospectively give himself some advice, mm -hmm. he would work on the communication and work on the programs that so many Idahoans had trouble with. Because it feels like a year ago, Brian, we talked about the Department of Labor and those programs almost on a daily basis. Right. A lot of frustration there. And speaking of frustration, we're about to end those federal extra dollars coming up well, about two weeks from now. So we're going to see if that does anything when it comes to the workforce out there and get more people out and working these jobs that are looking to hire. Interesting to say that he, or to hear him say that, yeah, there were a couple bills I didn't want to sign, but I did anyway kind of says a little bit about kind of where the status of the legislative session was. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic there where you have the governor expressing concerns in his transmittal letters and then still signing them anyways. I know that for the most part, there are people that believe that the governor's job is to rubber stamp some things. Others say that the governor should be more critical of things. It is what it is. He signed them into law, Brian, and you heard partially the explanation behind why. Okay, very quickly, he did not tell you he is running for governor officially yet, did he? Governor Little has not officially filed to run for governor, so until he does, he's not in the race. All right, thank you very much, Joe. And Governor Little, still, as you said, still plans to run. We just haven't had that official announcement yet, yet, that is. But that hasn't stopped the list of those who would like to replace him. Well, that list keeps getting longer.
Today, an announcement from the other side of the ticket and a name some of you may be familiar with. Melissa Sue Robinson. She's the first transgender person to run for governor in Idaho, but certainly this isn't the first time she's run for office. The 70 year old Democrat has run for several public offices in Idaho since 2009, including several attempts to become the mayor of Napa, as well as she had a Senate run back in 2020. A win for Robinson would be the first for a transgender candidate in Idaho. So Robinson is the first Democratic candidate declaration so far with a name. Then she knows and she joins current Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan, Ed Humphreys, Jeff Cotton and Cody Usabel. Those are on the Republican side. There's also this man, Ammon Bundy, who wants to run as a Republican, but they don't exactly want him to. In fact, there's no doubt they don't. Idaho GOP Chairman Tom Luna is saying this today. Ammon Bundy, not welcome in the Idaho GOP, adding, we do not support his antics or his chaotic political theater. That is not the Idaho Republican Party, and we will not turn a blind eye to his behaviors. You may remember the anti-government activist quietly filed with the Secretary of State's office last month to run for governor of Idaho as a Republican. However, according to the Sec Secretary of State, not only is Bundy not registered as a Republican, He's flat out not even registered to vote in Idaho, which is required to run for office. But let's assume he does that. Let's put that part aside. The state Republican Party would like to put Bundy even farther aside. Luna went on to say Bundy wishes to divide our party, openly supports defunding the police and has known alliances with the radical factions of the Black Lives Matter movement. To be clear, Bundy has said he's reached out to them. We don't believe they formed an actual alliance. In fact, we know that they have also distanced themselves from Bundy. Oh, and there's more. Luna, alluding to Bundy currently being banned from the Idaho State House for trespassing, added, Republicans are the party of law and order, and Ammon Bundy is not suited to call himself an Idaho Republican, let alone run for governor of our great state. Bundy did refile his campaign finance paperwork three days after he first filed, naming a new treasurer who is actually registered to vote. But he also still listed himself as a Republican. It was a man-made disaster that changed the landscape and the lives of Idahoans 45 years ago this weekend. We're taking a look back at the Teton Dam collapse. Not that we don't want to look forward, like maybe to what y'all are doing this weekend. But before we get to that, let's make sure we get to this. Text us whatever questions or comments you have about the show. The number is on your screen, 208-321-5614. Just be sure to include your name in the hashtag, the 208. We know it's Friday, but you might want to stick around. We could share yours at the end of the show. This is our, a piece of Idaho history, and the children need to know that this was a great thing that happened. Living in the West, Idaho is really no stranger to natural disasters. We lived through floods and wildfires. Remember Snowmageddon? All things Mother Nature threw at us, and some with little to no warning. But June 5th, 1976 was different. Tomorrow marks the anniversary of the Teton Dam collapse. 
Not a natural disaster, but a man-made one and a tragic one. We continue to remember 45 years later. It took almost four years to build. The water that cascaded down through there is unbelievable. And mere hours to collapse. About 300 feet of water in depth at that time, more than 300 feet. And it began to come through. I think at first it came through about 60 foot wall and 100 feet. And finally the whole dam on the north side gave way. And it, uh, it's a scene that it just took your breath and you wondered what's going to happen downstream. What happened downstream was a wall of water that left the collapsed Teton Dam at a million cubic feet per second, hitting some places at least 30 feet high. By 8 p.m., the flow of water had nearly stabilized, but not before essentially destroying the communities of Rexburg and Sugar City. In the end, 11 people were killed, along with scores of livestock. It caused more than $400 million in property damage. Damages and death that could have been prevented. From 1972 to 1975, crews built the earthen Teton Dam 12 miles northeast of Rexburg in eastern Idaho. At 305 feet high, the reservoir it would create was supposed to provide flood control, hydropower, and supplemental irrigation water for more than 111,000 acres of farmland in the upper Snake River Valley. Finally finished, they began to fill it a foot at a time in the fall of 1975. The following spring runoff doubled that rate, eventually rising to four feet a day. By early June, inspection crews found a couple of weak spots in the dam where water was seeping through. But as the water kept rising behind it, those spots were considered minor. That is, until 11.52 a.m., June 5th. I put my son and my daughter in the car. They were eight and 10, and we drove to Rexburg. We had 20 minutes warning, and my daughter I looked in the rearview mirror and she says, Mother, look out the rearview mirror. You can see the water going across the road. The collapse flooded 300 square miles. Homes and cars were carried away by the floodwaters, leaving two thirds of Rexburg residents homeless. The water took three days to reach American Falls, some 70 miles away, where it stopped because of another dam already in place. Investigators later determined that the collapse was due to a series of design and construction flaws. Human error. Today, the spillway and the unmoved mound of dirt remain, a reminder of water's power and the tragic events of 45 years ago. After that day, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation instituted the Dam Safety Program, which is now used as a worldwide standard for every new dam built. 45 years later, the remnants, as you saw at that picture, they're still sitting there untouched, and there's been no attempt to rebuild the Teton Dam.
June 19th, 2020, almost a full year ago. That was the last time we hit the streets asking you to tell us your good news. But with the COVID numbers down and the number of people getting out is up, we wanted to head to downtown Boise once again. And man, have we missed it. We figured what better way to head into the first weekend of June 2021 with our first in person feel good Friday. It's such a great day. It is. So beautiful, so nice, great weather. <laughs> Is this rolling, Shanti? Not yet. Sweet, it is now. Hi. How you doing? Good. We have not been out here doing this in a long time. Well, good. It's good to see you again. Do you want to join her? You want to come? Sure. <laughs> so you're asking for good news. Asking for good um, news. I just started a, a job, an internship, doing exactly what I want to do. Um, yeah, I got a pretty, a pretty cool job. I get to work downtown and go to lunch at cool places and just kind of enjoy the city. Not a bad place to be on a Friday. No, no, beautiful day. We got people out here. It's Downtown is hopping. It's pretty cool. You've got some good news. I do. What's your good news, Bob? Uh, my good news is that my one of my children is getting married on August 7th, and he's marrying his girlfriend from junior high. They've only dated one another, so we're, we're extremely excited. From junior high? Yep, Hillside Junior High. <laughs> That's awesome. Are you staying out of the planning process? Um, well, I'm, I'm involved in the planning process to the extent they want me involved. So <laughs> my best friend is coming into town from near Canada on Sunday, so. How long has it been since you've seen your friend, Ian? Several months, but before that, before the last time I saw her, it was about two and a half years. Wow, that's good news. We're potato farmers. Get out of here. We have good news that our friends Squeaky and Charlie are visiting from Spokane this weekend. Squeaky and Charlie. Perfect. That is a great couple. <laughs> Hi. Thanks. <laughs> What's your name? Octavian. Octavian. Yes. That is a great name. But you guys can call me Ox. Most people call me Ox. Ox. I'm going to call you Ox. Cool. Ox, what's your good news? My good news is that we finally made it on our road trip. We're going cross country. And we've made it through four states already. What are they? Um, Arizona? I can't remember the other three. On our road trip, we are going to see manatees and lots of other animals. Nevada. Where are you from, Lizette? Black Idaho. All right, what brings you to Boise? My mom's birthday. How old? She is gonna, she is 45. Nice. Yes, good age. Happy birthday, mom. Utah. So what's the good news? What do you want to share? Um, I was talking to my investor guy who like manages my portfolio and I found out that I have a separate account that my dad had and there's a bunch of money in there. The found, found, found money. Found money. It was great. A Friday surprise. Wow. <laughs> I know. Are that you going to celebrate? Um, I mean, we just had some lunch. I was going to go to the gym, but I was like, screw it. Let's have some lunch. So we're looking for people's good news today. Some very great news. What's your news? I moved to Indiana right before the pandemic from Moscow after college. Okay. Um, went to U of I, Idaho girl through and through. Moved to Indiana. Today is my first day back in Idaho after the pandemic. Awesome, how does it feel? <laughs> it feels awesome. I just got here like 20 minutes ago. This is fantastic. I missed it so much. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, I get to see my two and a half year old niece for the first time. Um, she was born when I left, and now I finally get to see her. Are you mom? I'm mom. She's mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's this feel? Well, it's just been constant tears since she's yeah. come back, so. All 20 minutes. Yeah, All exactly. 20 minutes. <laughs> huh? In Idaho. In Idaho. Oh, yeah, would you forget where you were? Come on, Ox. Glad we can welcome you with this. Thank you so much. It was nice yeah. to talk to you. Thank you for stopping by. Take it easy. <laughs> you Thank too. you. Yeah, that's the good news. That's great news. I think so. Thanks for letting me share it. Thanks, Bob.
All right, before we wrap up the week, let's get to your comments you sent in during today's show on this Friday. A lot of people taking issue with the Idaho GOP saying eh, they're the party of law and order like this one. We've seen a lot of variations of this, like this one from Sheila. If Republicans are the party of law and order, why didn't they vote for the January 6th investigation? That would have shown support for the Capitol Police as well as, well, other things as well. Several of our Republican lawmakers in Washington did not vote for that. So the GOP, Idaho GOP doesn't care for Bundy's antics, but they don't have a problem with Lieutenant Governor that attempts to heavy handedly circumvent the authority of city mayors and local health authorities, asks Ed. Again, more problems with the law and order. It's too bad the GOP in Idaho won't distance themselves from the antics of McGeehan and the disgusting actions of Giddings, said Jim. So that's kind of the theme for today. But yes, we enjoyed bringing back the Good News Friday segment as well. Maybe we can do it more often. We'll see you next week.